Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. I'm uh, I'm all right. I think I'm beginning to get a cold, which is unfortunate. It has been raining here in Dublin since, well, I don't know actually what time it, it started raining at. It was raining when I woke up this morning at quarter to six and it's still raining. And we've had two types of rain, heavy rain and unbelievably torrential, heavy, heavy, super heavy rain. It's mental. And it's not great when you've got dogs because dogs do not give a fuck about the rain. They're like, I don't care. I've got fur coat here. I can just shake all that off. So it's been a, it's been something of a damp day. This gray, oppressive rain is in some ways symbolic of what's happening at Arsenal right now. There's no sunshine, there's no blue sky, there's no birds cheeping. It's just carrion crows and vultures and pissing rain as far as the eye can see. But we do have a podcast for you. Of course we do. You're listening to it. But it's a, it's a good show today. We're going to be chatting to Andrew Allen now in a few minutes about all that's going on at Arsenal. We're going to get a Leicester perspective on the upcoming game this weekend, which may or may not have a significant impact on the future of Arsenal Football Club, depending on what happens on the pitch and what happens to Unai Emery, if anything, if things go, if things go wrong, which they might. They may not, but they might, based on our current form. You can't be too confident going into this one. So it could be, it could be a day that goes down in Arsenal history or infamy or whatever you want to call it. And not only that, we got something a bit extra for you as well towards the end of the show, which I think you will like. So um, since last we talked on the Arscast Extra and last week's show, we've, we've drawn to Wolves, we've drawn to Victoria. Our poor form continues, frustration grows, and I think the uh, pressure is beginning to tell a bit on Unai Emery. I don't know if you saw his uh, pre-match interview ahead of the Vittoria game on BT Sport. Unai Emery usually uses a lot of words, lots of them in a row. So he's asked a question, he talks for ages and ages and ages. That wasn't the case this time as he was being asked about uh, Rob Holding captaining the side in the absence of any of the other 16 captains we have. In Rob, you have another new captain from the start of a match. How distracting has the issue of the captain's role been and, and what's happened with Granite in the past week or so? No, today you see, you see a lot of holding and for and it's perfect. Why? Mm, because I think uh, why? <laughs> I, because he's. And in terms of your other selections, you've got Martinelli who plays through the middle from the start. Why has he been able to start his career with Arsenal so strongly? Yet yeah, he's so young. Yes, he's young, but he's working very well. What do you like about him? Uh, I think you you can and uh, every supporter you can uh, look at him uh, his quality. Good luck tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And what you don't get from the audio there is the facial expression of a man who would rather be anywhere but talking to a football reporter about his own team. And it's not even as if those questions are quite difficult. Why is Rob holding a good choice for captain? What's good about Gabriel Martinelli? He just wasn't in the mood. He was not in the mood. And I do think he, well, he'd be mad not to be feeling the pressure. And whatever else you might say about Emery, whether you like his football, you don't like his football, whether you think he's the right man for the job or not, I don't think he's stupid so he can't be unaware of the the tide turning against him in terms of uh, you know fan opinion and whether he's the right man for the job or not he must also realize that the run of form that we're on with just one win from our last six games just six wins from our last 18 Premier League games across the last uh, this season and last season is not good enough you know standards at Arsenal should be high and if they're not, then you're going to be in trouble. That is the way that it goes, whether it's Unai Emery or anybody else. They would be under the same scrutiny for producing these results. So it is a hell of a weekend. It really is a hell of a weekend. We are going to talk Leicester, of course, in a, in a little while. We'll look ahead to that game. But first and foremost, let's get into the nitty gritty, the dirty underbelly of the Arsenal metropolis. It's been another difficult week, so let's uh, let's get into it. Let's do Europa League, let's do Emery, let's do the squad, and much more with Andrew Allen. Hi, Andrew. Hey there. Let's start with what happened in Portugal on Wednesday late afternoon. It wasn't even Wednesday night football again. It was Wednesday late afternoon when people were still in work football. It 
felt like the kind of game that kickoff time deserved. Yeah, it was awful. Really, really bad. I mean, there was something of, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will kind of share the, the same view as me. There was a sort of novelty value out of, you know, leaving work early to try and find somewhere to watch the match. And I guess in some weird respect that gave it, a, you know, there was something to look forward to, right? It's supposed to be better than being at work. Yeah. Um, it really wasn't. <laughs> Um, it was so depressed. I sat in a sports bar and I just had my head in my hands. I think you, I mean, as a football fan, you always kid yourself into thinking that today will be a better day. And recently with Emery's team, I've kind of really had to sort of strain to, to even have that little smidgen of hope before sitting down to watch a game. But once again, it was just so bad. So, so bad. Yeah, I know. I saw you tweet about it because a, a way of dealing with something that's awful and bad and consistently bad is to is to use humor or to, you know, attempt to, uh, yeah. attempt to like gallows humor, they might call it, where you, you sort of try and go, well, this is awful. Let's, let's have a laugh, at least if we can laugh. Mm. But beneath that, there is something fundamentally unpleasant about what's happening at Arsenal at this moment in time. And, you know, uh, I take, and I'm sure that applies to absolutely everybody who listens to this, no pleasure whatsoever in seeing the team that I support play as badly as we have been, perform as badly as we have been, um, enduring the kind of problems that we have. And you get weird people who say, well, this is all part of your agenda or or whatever it might be. And I just can't get my head around that because I would much rather, and I'm sure you would too, when mm. we do our stuff, be talking about an Arsenal team that's good, that plays well, that wins games, that scores goals, that can defend, that has a midfield that works. All of those things are things that we all want. So if there's an air of negativity it's not coming just because right i want to be a crank i want to be somebody who who um winds people up you know as a kind of a shock jock type thing that's not mm. what it is it's coming from a place where you really really want arsenal to be good and the longer that we're not the more difficult it is to to see what is good if there is anything good at this moment in time Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm only reacting to what I'm seeing, and what I'm seeing is obviously a, a, a team of players who seem to be trying to execute a game plan every week, and they're not quite nailing it because there's no way that Unai Emery wants them to play the way they're playing. I'm assuming because that's not a way to win football games. I mean, we'll probably get onto it, but the heat map from the passing that you know, we displayed the other night, which replicated stuff that we've been doing recently, kind of avoiding danger areas at the pitch. It's just, it's, it's, it's very frustrating. I mean, I think, you know, we, we went through the, the mill a bit over the summer off the back of the Europa League. I think a lot of people were very dejected, but then to have the hope, you know, that came with the new signings, you know, there was a sort of feel good factor um, going into the new season and bit by bit, I mean, it's just been ground out of us. I feel um, I remember, I can't remember, it was, I think it was at the, the, the Aston Villa game that you were over for when we'd come back from 2-0 uh, down to win 3-2 or 2-1 down to yeah. win 3-2. And I didn't really take any joy out of it because I was so frustrated at, it was a kind of angry joy if there was any joy. It was a sort of like, great, I'm glad we've won that one, but Jesus Christ, we made our life really difficult. And we haven't really played very well at all, apart from that 5-0, I guess, against Nottingham Forest in the League Cup. And there was another Europa League game where we did quite well against Standard, Standard Liege. Liege, yeah. But I mean, those games, you know, they're, they're not the, they're, they're not, they're not kind of, you know, lunch and dinner, they're snacks. You know, we need to start, you know, feasting properly um, in the main meals. And uh, it, this season's just getting away from us at the moment. Mm. How do you explain a coach who was brought in and presented to us as somebody who would be tactically more um, savvy than Arsene Wenger, for example? Um, you know, somebody who, you know, this idea that by by being tactically flexible, by tailoring your approach to the opposition uh, in certain games, you know, would, would be better for us. Um, and I think that, that that's probably true if you do it in certain games rather than do it every single game. But I looked at Arsenal on Wednesday night, having changed the formation again, having played a back three for the first time this season, and I looked at what we produced on the pitch and I saw great big empty spaces in midfield. 
uh, where our, our the center of our midfield should have been players just not in the area where the ball should be if you want to try and play anything approaching uh, effective progressive football I saw central defenders pass the ball back and forward between them making these giant U shapes and and as you pointed out the the pass map showed one successful pass into the opposition penalty box out of 520 passes we had one successful delivery into their box and that was the goal in the 80th minute and that was a dead ball so how how do you explain this apparent tactical ineptitude with the picture or the vision of Emery as, as it was sold to us? I mean, it, I, uh, I think it's it's really difficult. I think you pointed out that, you know, he, he seems to really, really struggle with games against sides that Arsenal fans traditionally would just assume we'd win. You mm. know, our, our quality and our ability to just play free-flowing attacking football would see us overcome in the end. And... We we had that even in the the tail end of the Wenger era when when things were going wrong. You know we could still pull out a, a, a decent win or a comfortable win at home or against the Minnow even away. Maybe not the last season, but Emery seems to set these teams up seemingly with sort of not just one eye on the opposition but two. Yeah, and I I I, I just I can't I can't understand it. It's so strange. And the thing is, if if the players you watch the game and you watch the players doing what they're doing and you can only assume that they're doing what they're told because they do it repeatedly. They can't be so stupid so as not to execute a different game plan or something. I mean, the, the players are seemingly doing what they're asked, but they're doing it badly, surely, because otherwise he would drop the players who are not featuring all the time. I, 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 I'm so confused by it. I don't understand how you can win a game of football or at least come across how you can assume that you're going to flummox the opposition by playing the way that we're playing and repeatedly doing it. I mean, every side seems to know how to play against us right now yeah. because we don't have any central midfielders. I mean, you know, all you've got to do is sort of add a little bit of extra cover on the wide positions to make sure that the overlapping fullbacks, whether they're playing in a three or a four, or what have you, are covered. And you're, you're pretty much stimming any attacking intent we have. Yeah. And I feel really bad for some of the players because, you know, whether it be a £72 million new signing or an 18-year-old coming through the ranks, everybody is being made to look average by the system that we're, we're, we're executing at the moment. Mm. And I, I, it, that, they, their confidence is going to get knocked. How is Pepe supposed to you know, lay the foundations for an amazing career if the team is just seemingly set up with huge gaps around him so he's never going to find a player? How are we going to bolster the confidence of a kid coming through the ranks who's obviously like got talent, but he needs to then kind of consolidate that with players who are also playing confident football. Yeah. I'm really worried that we're going to kind of just, you know, slightly kill everybody over the course of the next few weeks if we don't make some kind of fundamental decision as to what football we want to play and whether Emery is the right man. We were uh, talking a, a few minutes ago about Kieran Tierney and some quotes that came out uh, from him after the Vittoria game or maybe... Uh, yeah, I think they were after the Victoria game. And he's mm. talking about adapting and he talks about Unai Emery and says he's been brilliant. I've learned a lot uh, about his style of play. And I was thinking, okay, let's see let's see what it is. And Tierney says he likes to keep the ball, pass the ball with a possession type game. And I'm learning and working on my technique with him. And I'm thinking, well, whatever he's telling them that he wants on the training route, we're not seeing it on the pitch. We can't, I mean, that's not what we do. We don't like to keep the ball. We don't, you know, we had lots of possession uh, against Vittoria, but then you would expect Arsenal to have lots of possession against Vittoria. Um, mm. it, it seems to be at odds with what we're seeing on the pitch. All the things that are said seem to be at odds with what we're doing on the pitch. And I think you're right to talk about, you know, players looking a little bit lost and lacking confidence. Um, I think it's to do with the chopping and the changing of formation and system. Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, while, I, while I guess on paper I'm kind of um, in favour of the, the, the squad being split between the competitions, there is also a bit of me that kind of feels like, you know, and Wenger was quite good at this sometimes. He, he realised that if the team was lacking any kind of momentum, if it hadn't won in a few games, he would even he would put a stronger team out occasionally against against a weaker team just to try and, you know, get them firing again, as it were. Uh, the fact that we kind of completely take Lacazette out of the game or uh, Aubameyang out of the game, take Ozil out of all of these games, um, I feel like we're kind of, 
not maybe making the best use of some of the game time that we have available to us to kind of build the automatisms that, you know, Wenger and Mertesacker used to talk about. You know, there's some of the relationships between, like, I don't know whether Tierney's going to play with, you know, Saka in front of him in the next game or if he's going to play with, you know, someone else. Um, you or know, if he's he going to play. A relationship with Aubameyang, or if he's going to play at all. I mean, I, I, I find that level of kind of confusion really quite odd. Um I, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really flummoxed by it, and I, I, I have no kind of expectations going into the next game, and I think once you reach that point, you really have kind of got a problem, mm. really got a problem, because most of the fans now must be looking at Leicester away on Saturday night and thinking, we're not going to win that. Mm. We might, we're probably not even going to get a draw, but we know that Jamie Vardy's going to score. We're probably going to concede some stupid goals. But when, you know, the type of football we know is going to probably be this attempt to play out from the back, try and play it down the wings, try and get someone overlapping so that we can do some kind of pullback. I mean, all of this, we know all of this now. And, you know, if we know it, the opposition know it, which means it's going to be even easier for them to kind of, you know, plan for us. I, I, something has to change is where I'm at now. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that, um, Emery might think he said, well, I'll do something different. I'll do something they don't expect me to do. Um, but then again, that's something different for our players to, to deal with. Well, and to I mean, if they with. can't deal with the, 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 the plan that he's trying to execute week in, week out, then chopping and changing it at random is, is, is just going to, I mean, it, it's a sign of being desperate, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, but, you know, again, I don't know what the plan is week in, week out. I don't know whether we play out from the back. I don't know whether we <laughs> press. I don't know whether we're supposed to be a team that, that dominates possession. I don't know if we're supposed to be a team that sits back and, uh, and tries to counterattack. And I, I saw Martin Keown actually on BT Sport uh, after the game on Wednesday night and I, I don't tend to watch a lot of post-game stuff but he he picked the team for um, for Leicester and he said they might as well just go for it they might as well just throw it uh, the kitchen sink at Leicester from an attacking point of view because Arsenal mm. can't defend and I you know I I I tend to agree with that, to be honest. I don't see the point in us trying to control uh, Leicester from a defensive point of view because ultimately, if we do that at the expense of some of our attacking potency or potential attacking potency, you know, I think we know what the what the answer is going to be. We, we can't defend. We're 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 worse defensively than I think we were um, under Wenger, and. We are, what's the word I'm looking for here? We're not making the most of the attacking talent that we have in the team. And I think, I look at Pepe starting in this in this game against Vitoria. You know, mm. he scored two magnificent free kicks in the last game to, to bail Emery out. He didn't even get off the bench against Wolves. And he plays him 90 minutes in a game against Vitoria. And maybe, you know, I'm projecting, but I looked at him and I looked at a player who looked a bit pissed off that yeah. he was he was being asked to play in this game. And it's not that he wouldn't go out and do his best. And of course, every player, you know, when you're asked to play, you play and you do your best and you respect the decisions and, and all that kind of stuff. But when you're a £72 million club record signing and you've taken a step forward by scoring those two free kicks, got a bit of a confidence boost, and the next thing you know, you're being played in... Uh, uh, I won't yeah, say I a mean- meaningless game, but a game he did not need to play in. Well, I, I, I absolutely do not understand why he didn't come on against Wolves. No, me or, neither. Or, or, or didn't even feature at all. I mean, you know, I would have had him in the starting lineup. Yeah. But, you know, I, at this point, I think trying to second guess Emery's selections is, is really quite difficult. I mean, we've now got a really weird situation, basically due to him, where we've isolated our Mesut Ozil. We've now got a captaincy situation where... You know, the guy who was picked by the squad and by him has, within the space of a few weeks, lost it. And, con- you know, as far as I can see, it's probably not going to be included in the squad anytime soon. So we've lost two midfielders there just by him, you know, his own incompetence as a manager, mm. as a people person. Um, you've got a, a, a Spanish midfielder last night who definitely was not supposed to be sitting as a deep midfielder, had no idea what he was supposed to be doing, got deeper and deeper repeatedly during the game. I mean, you noticed, I think it was Gilberto who was in the studio next to Martin Keown last night. I could see he was just, you know, what on earth are they attempting to do? Yeah. Um, you know, you've got youngsters. Poor Joe Willock, you know, who's 
shown so much ability so far this season and you put him into a system where he's basically constantly on his own in the center of a park surrounded by three opponents trying to wriggle out of situations growing more and more frustrated the length that players have to make passes seems crazy. You know, you see them all doing these Rondo kind of like exercises pre-game where everyone's within about four or five yards of each other. And by the time they get on the pitch, they have to play the ball 20 yards. Yeah. Um, Did you see the thing I, last night or in uh, before the Vittoria game where they were using... Uh, the ball boy. The ball boy. And I thought yeah. people were saying, oh, that's, oh, that's nice. yeah, isn't that nice? That's sweet. And I was kind of thinking, <laughs> it's not though. I mean, it's nice for the ball boy. Yeah. But it's won not a game in six, so yeah, maybe yeah, concentrate a bit. Yeah, a bit more focus, lads. Yeah, I mean, I, at this point, it becomes very easy to pick holes in a lot of things. I, 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 the one thing I don't really want to do, actually, is I'm, at the moment not blaming the players. I feel like the players are trying to do whatever it is that Emery's asking them. He's just obviously not able to communicate it properly. I don't feel like the players are lacking in effort. Um but they, like us, seem to feel like there's an inevitability about things. I mean, when we went one up the other day, I, I mean, I laughed. I laughed when Vittoria scored. Um, my laughter very quickly became, you know, annoyance because it looked very, it looked very likely they were going to grab a winner, despite the fact there was barely any time on the clock whatsoever. I mean, the yeah. fact they t- squandered two other chances, we completely went to pieces. Absolutely went to pieces. If the game had gone on for another ten minutes, we'd have conceded probably twice. Um, we were lucky in a way that they scored so late. Yeah. And that's ridiculous. That is really, really ridiculous. But that's the sign of players who just cannot keep it together. Their confidence, they're just completely freaked out. Scared. Scared. Dare we use the word. Um, yeah. I, I mean, if you're looking at it objectively, if you step back and looked at any other team performing in the way that Arsenal are performing right now with one win in the last six games, I mean, you, 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 you only have to go back three games and we were a point ahead of Leicester point ahead of Leicester and a win there would have opened up the gap to four points and we would have um, I think temporarily gone ahead of Manchester City maybe not I can't remember quite the sequence of games but within three games we're six points behind Leicester City who can now go nine points ahead of us if they beat us on on Saturday night and uh, you know you're right to to point this out that the players went to pieces and I think it's to do with just a lack of confidence, a lack of belief, a lack of information, a lack of understanding about what exactly it is that that they're supposed to be doing. Mm. Um, The minute anything, I mean, it happened under Wenger as well. Do you remember like the minute we had a setback, it was like, oh Jesus, now what? Panic stations. One of the biggest problems I've, I've, uh, you know, the, the trend has always been, the, the five minutes after we concede one, we look so terribly vulnerable. And we've been like that for two or three years now. Um, I mean, we lost the Europa League final because of it. Um, we've lost several other big games in the same way. A mm. complete like loss of uh, a failure to control the game. Now, I get it. Momentum switches in a game. You know, an opposition suddenly finds that they're riding high and they they, they smell blood and they're going for you. But somehow we always we almost always manage to concede in those periods, and you've just got to be able to ride it out somehow. I mean, you've got to have a bit of sense. You've got to not give away stupid free kicks in dangerous areas. You've got to decide, okay, well maybe the wingers should maybe drop a little bit deeper for the next few minutes. Let's just get a handle on the game again, and then we'll we'll sort of build into it slowly. Mm. We don't have that. It's a weird kind of lack of in-game intelligence. But do you, uh, I mean, do you think it comes back to that issue of control? That, that when you're constantly scrapping to either get control of a game or to prevent the opposition doing what the opposition wants to do, that there's a sort of a fallibility built into that. Like you, you, I use the example of the Liverpool game where people were saying, well, we were right to stop them coming down the middle because last season they, they tore us apart down the middle. But if you give them the wings and you allow them to heap pressure on you, inevitably you're going to crack or something is going to happen or you do something stupid because it's desperate. There's a sort of desperation about what we're trying to do. And as long as you're desperate, you're going to make bad decisions. Yeah, I mean, I think in that particular game, we, we, we put our hands up and recognised that Liverpool were very good straight down the middle. Unfortunately, their two biggest assist makers of the previous season were both on the wide, you know, fullback positions. Mm. So we see he seeded the middle. 
and or oh, sorry, seeded the wide positions to t- sort of try and cover the middle. But I mean, ultimately, they just were able to bombard the, the box with balls, which is what they were good at as well. I mean, the fact is, it's almost like Emery going, we, we don't have the quality within our squad to be able to cope with them, you know, yeah. whatever they do. So we'll just pick one and hope that that works. That, I mean, that's not great, is it? No. Um, I think just going back to what you were saying about how things have turned around you know, very recently that we were third just before the international break. I think you'd agree, though, that up to that point, we probably not really played a single good game of football, not a good solid 90 minutes of football. Not in the Premier League. Where we really, really dominated. Not in the Maybe, league, no. You know, we looked quite good against Burnley at one point, but really, like, we've we've been susceptible to counterattacks in every single game. We've conceded shots left, right and centre every single game, and we've really, really struggled to create chance of our own. Yeah, it's true. In the Premier League, there hasn't been a convincing performance. There hasn't been a win by more than a single goal. I, and I, that stretches back to last season. Yep. This has been going on a long, long time now. I yeah. think someone posted the stat, didn't they, before the last game about, you know, it's been uh, 18, in the last 18 games. We've won six. League, we've won six. We've, made, well, we've, we've amassed something like 24 points in total, which if you play out, given that we'll probably lose at the weekend, so over 19 games, let's say we accumulated 24, that's a 48-point total for a, for a season's worth of games. I mean, I know this is me being hypothetical and you'd expect yeah. to pick a few more there, but that is mid-table, lower mid-table performance. Mm. So it's bad. It is. It's bad. There's no. There are no two ways about it. What's happening is bad. Um, when you said earlier that you don't blame the players um, for struggling in this system and formation, and I agree with that to a large extent because I think the players that we have are, are capable of of much better than we're seeing. While ultimately the responsibility of of getting performance is on Emery and his coaching staff, that is literally his job. So there's a measure of blame for him if he can't do it. At what point do you start to shift some of that blame upstairs to uh, a football executive committee, a boardroom that is watching what we're watching, that has... um, just as much, if not more, information um, about our trajectory at this moment in time, about performance levels, about chance creation, about our defending, about our points, um, which I might have mentioned, but I can't quite remember. But at some point, we can't blame Unai Emery for being Unai Emery. The the decision has to come from higher up because, you know, he, yeah. he doesn't strike me as the sort of guy who's going to sit there, even if we lose to Leicester. He doesn't, I could be wrong, but he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who'll say, well, yeah, maybe I should resign. I, I think he is, I think he's going to have to be pushed. So mm. it is, it is incumbent on those people to protect the interests of the club first and foremost, because, we know how important it is to get back into the Champions League this season. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a by any means possible season for Arsenal when it comes to getting in the Champions League. I think the the people higher up the ladder will probably be more than happy to sacrifice style if it means we actually get in there. Mm. But it will not have, you know, they can't have failed to notice the fact that the performances are not pretty that the fundamentals are not in place there. We can't attack and we can't defend. Um, I, I do suspect a little bit that, you know, off the back of the start of the season, prior to the last international break, sitting in third place, they were willing to overlook some of that stuff so long as we kept ticking along, kept staying in the top four. At the same time, I also imagine opening discussions with potential new candidates takes a bit of time. And I think the way that we've just veered completely off track here has probably maybe taken them a little bit by surprise, but yeah. you would be expecting them at this point now to be putting out feelers somewhere, trying to open you know channels of communication with potential candidates. But they might just be buying themselves a little bit of time. The yeah. idea that we just get rid of Emery, while I you know wouldn't be opposed to that, comes with throwing in Freddie Lundberg, a guy who doesn't have a, a, a coaching team of his own around him. I mean, with Emery would go... Casado, the goalkeeping coach, a couple of others, you know, he's brought a team in. So it's a big commitment to get rid of them. 
I fear that with, you know, Per Mertesacker and Edu are obviously got a big focus on the academy at the moment. If you start pulling coaches out of, you know, the structure that they're trying to put in place to pull them into the first team, it upsets all of that. There's a lot of different moving parts, I imagine, to getting rid of somebody and bringing in someone new. Um, yeah, I so, mean, it'd be awkward and it'd be difficult, but it'd be... I mean, be... at some point, they're going to have to pull the trigger, though, because if this continues... Yeah, like if we, lo- if we lose to Leicester, can he stay... I mean, he can, oh. obviously, but should he? I mean, I don't I mean, think he should. I think he should be gone already. But I, I, I think if you if you lose to Leicester and it's a you know and it's a it's a hiding, and there really is nothing to take from it, it's the perfect opportunity because you go into an international break where you've got two weeks where things can sort of someone come in, settle down a little bit, and then you can try and kick on before this really busy festive period. Yeah. Um, you leave it and then you decide to do it in a couple of games' time. I'm not really sure where the benefit of that is, but, you know, if we were playing half decent football and losing, if you could see that we were trying to play a type of football that we were close to playing, but not quite, but doing what we're doing is just playing bad football week in, week out and not getting the results we want. Mm. That, I just, I, after a while, I just think you have to just, you just have to go, this is not working for us. You can't be in a relationship like that and know that it's just not working and think that you're going to just be able to ride it out for a while. You yeah. just know sometimes when it's not right. I mean, yeah, you can be you can be boring as a football team, but also be effective. You know, those two those two things um, don't have to go against each other. But when you're boring and when you're bad, and you're dropping points, and and you know maybe it's uh, anecdotal, but you know a lot of people are, are are talking about how they, you know, Arsenal is kind of sucking the life out of the the football experience for them at this moment. And yeah, we're supporters, and you've got to go through good times, you've got to go through bad times. We all understand there's ups and downs and and everything else. But you know you can't you can't also just bury your head in the sand when things are as bad as they are at this moment in time. I just. I mean- the the empty seats at the Emirates now. I mean, if ten years ago, even the League Cup games were full sellouts. Now you, you kind of look around and you can see smatterings of empty seats everywhere, all the time, every game, and it's really depressing because I think yeah. people kind of arrive. They're not looking forward to the game, so they're not up for it. So there's no atmosphere. So the players start playing their game. The play, you know, the fans sort of sit and grumble we kind of get a bit up for it if the opposition scores because then we're like, well, oh God, we better put, you know, we better pull our finger out and try and get them to go again, the Arsenal players. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really odd. There's a, there's a, it, that relationship is, it's once it's, once it's gone, it's very hard to heal that between a manager and a fans, I think. And it really feels like he's losing the fans at a rapid rate. Mm. I mean, that is one of the considerations that they, they have to look at as well is, is, you know, it shouldn't necessarily be the driver for a decision, but it should be, um, it should be part of it is fan sentiment. If fans are staying away, if fans are bored, if fans mm. aren't interested in the football club or aren't as interested or feel perhaps that their interest is waning in the football club because of what's going on, literally what's going on on the pitch is affecting that, that has to be something they're mindful of because... Uh, you know, it goes to the reputation and it goes to, you know, our attractiveness when we go back into the transfer market. And it goes to things like keeping our best players. And when you underperform, your best players, as sure as eggs is eggs, they want to leave. Mm. I mean, the the contract situation that we have now with a few players is, it, it, yeah, I mean, that is a genuine worry, right? I mean... You, you you look at a Bamiyang and Lacazette and you think why would they stay? Why would they stay? Aside from you know they've got a nice setup and they're mates and they're playing football every week if they want it. Yeah. Like what what about those those guys are winners? They want to play at the highest end. They you know they've stuck it out with us so far, but they need you know. And obviously it's on them to to deliver the goods on the pitch to help us do that. But you know if they're looking around and they're thinking I can't work with this guy. It's the same in any job. If you yeah. have a, an absolute burke of a boss and you don't believe in his methods and you feel unhappy every day because he's making you do dumb stuff, eventually you're going to leave. Yeah. You know, that's just what people do. Well, look, we'll see what this weekend brings. We go into an interlull after the Leicester game. It mm. could be one which sees um, some serious change at Arsenal. Who knows? But it it is a... It's amazing to say with so many games left in the season, it does feel like a real six-pointer. Absolutely. I mean, I think the strange thing is, is even if Arsenal pull off a win against Leicester, there's still going to be a very big 
kind of question mark over Emery's future. I mean, it will be a massive, timely confidence boost to beat Leicester because mm. they are playing very good football at the moment. And in Rodgers, they seem to have found a coach who suits them. You know, he's he's at a level where he's comfortable. They have a very balanced squad. They seem to have kind of, you know, with it's 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 somewhat ironic that the the guy at the centre of their defence who's come in, uh, Kaglas and Yuku, the, the the Turkish guy, was so heavily linked with Arsenal but didn't end up moving to us. Yeah. Um. And he's gone in there and you know after a year of basically feeling out the Premier League, has become an absolute star this year. Um. Hmm. And they've got Colo Torre on their you know coaching team <laughs> helping them out. I don't know. You know, Leicester are probably if you you know Leicester are kind of doing things the way that you'd hope Arsenal would maybe be doing things right now. Mm. Well, yeah, but without I don't I don't want Brendan Rodgers. No, 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 no. I I, I no. know, but you know we are in that kind of position where it feels like it would be churlish to turn down. Um, I say almost anyone who might be good for the job because we've, we've already mm. had the yeah. I mean, yeah, we've already had the point. Mourinho discussion. We don't need to have that again. So no, no, All absolutely right. not. All right. Well, look. Let's see what the weekend brings us, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can follow Andrew on Twitter at a Allen Sport at a Allen Sport doing news for Arsblog News at Arsblog News and also his own podcast, which you can find at leftfield underscore pod at leftfield underscore pod talking about football and sport and other stuff besides. Check it out. It's a good listen. Right. We have Leicester at the weekend, so I thought it might be good to get a Leicester point of view uh, ahead of this particular fixture because it is a big one for Arsenal. Also a very big one for Leicester who are enjoying a good time under new boss Brendan Rogers. And with me, uh, a Leicester fan with a with a bit of an Arsenal uh, past. Joe Bruin used to write for Arsenal.com, so some of you may know him from that. Joe, how are you? Hello, how's it going? Good, thanks. Um, I suppose the first thing I want to talk to you about is this season for Leicester and where you are um, in comparison to where you thought you might be. Is it going better than you expected? Yeah, it, it definitely is. I mean, I think pre-season expectations, you know, you've got your, your optimists who, who looked at the way that a lot of the, the the sort of traditional clubs outside of Liverpool and Man City were set up, and there was definitely an opportunity to kind of exploit a lot of that. But I think it's definitely gone better than most people have expected. I think the top six was 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 the height of ambitions, really, maybe mm. the top four. Um, personally, I thought we were going to finish seventh, so this is going very well so far. You know, we're still quite early in the season, in fairness, and a lot can change in a, in a short period of time. But yeah, it it is going well. You've got the league's um, leading scorer in Jamie Vardy, uh, who's still banging them in, having not signed for Arsenal a couple of years ago, as we know. I, I want to ask about Brendan Rodgers, though, because he is somebody who's been mentioned in connection with the Arsenal job a couple of times in, in, in recent history. Of course, when Arsene Wenger left, his name came up before they appointed Unai Emery. Now, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Here, you will have you're watching Leicester much more closely than I am, but it seemed to me anyway from the outside that quite quickly, from the time he took over, he looked to imprint a, a kind of playing style, a style of play on the team that he's obviously honed and developed over over a, a while now. But it, is that the case, or am I kind of just wishful thinking that that's something that managers do? No, that that is that's definitely fair. Um, I think Claude Puel kind of introduced it at first. Um, there was definitely like you know, the, kind of the transition from being a, a more direct team that won won the Premier League and from going to something that was a bit more sustainable in the long term. That was the Puel was the kind of the driving force behind that. However, uh, the football just ended up being quite stale, and the players ultimately just didn't really like him. Uh, I think that's been a bit of a pattern with his history. But mm. what Brendan Rodgers has done has kind of just reinvigorated them. You know, he's introduced some of his own ideas. Um, we're, we're certainly more patient in the build-up. Um, we're we're pretty, pretty controlling most games at the moment, um, and it, it's kind of just seen in things like you know Wilfred and Didi not taking shots from thirty yards and, and firing them into rows double Z. <laughs> it's 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 waiting and, and being. A bit more patient like you see teams like the best teams do like Man City and Liverpool waiting and that's why I think we've got such a good conversion rate this season because the chances that we are creating are, are really strong ones but yeah Brendan Rodgers has just kind of breathed a new a new life into the place really I can't, I can't remember an appointment 
in most clubs' history where where pretty much every single fan was happy with it. But yeah. so far, it's 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 proved you know everyone everyone right really. Everyone's a bit right to be excited by him at the time. Yeah, I mean, look, when his name was mentioned with, with Arsenal, he was somebody I thought maybe no, I I don't want him. And you know, it's it's not necessarily his skills as a football manager. It's more to do with his personality and his yeah. face, you know. Um, which I admit might be small and petty of me, but it's just, it is what it is. But he does seem to have um, consolidated Leicester and, and the way that you're playing and the the way that you're performing, the way that you're attacking, the way that you're creating chances, uh, which is a, an issue for Arsenal, of course, really is, is very impressive. Uh, it feels like everybody is, uh, you know, players and fans are on board with what he's doing. Absolutely, they definitely are. I mean, it's, it, he hasn't really encountered a situation where, you know, things aren't going so well. And I think there is a lot mm. to be said for kind of getting out of those situations as well. But I think I think that generally the makeup of our squad is um, is partly why I took the job in the first place, to be honest. You know, there, there were some good foundations already laid in that there was a lot of good young players there who had sort of been brought, brought in by Puel. But what Rogers has done is just kind of reinvigorated them and and kind of he's, I think he's probably good at blowing smoke up their ass as well when they when they need to <laughs> you know you look at someone like James Madison for example who was already good last year but he's just even better this year and you can imagine someone like Rogers to just go in uh, put his arm around him tell him he's great and and just carry on doing what he's doing and I think it doesn't take much sometimes for a player to just switch on and, and just be that little bit better if they're getting the right sort of encouragement around them but it's just it's just a situation at the moment where everything is going right, and, and it's quite it's quite unnerving actually. I've got to say. <laughs> well, look, you know, from somebody uh, whose club uh, uh, looks like everything's going wrong at this moment in time, I'd rather be where you are than, than where where, where <laughs> yeah, Arsenal definitely. are at this moment in time. But it, it feels quite similar to the title-winning season in that if you ignore Man City and Liverpool, mm. it's just it's just so open from there, and. You know that our, t- our, t- our team is better than it was then. You know we were we were, we were very well organised that season and were really good at grinding out vic- at wins basically. But yeah. this year we're we're more of a front foot team and you know th- this is a great game for us this weekend because you know th- the chance to go nine points clear of Arsenal is at this early stage is is really huge because you know the top four is is basically open for for two other teams and and at this stage there's no reason why we can't be one of them. Yeah, for sure. And that's why it's so worrying from an Arsenal point of view that we don't seem to be reacting to this this spell of form under Unai Emery, which stretches back to last season. Um, and which I think, you know, if we, if we do get beaten on Saturday by Leicester and end up nine points behind you, you, you know, you can say, OK, that, that turnaround has happened in four games, basically, you know, because uh, after eight games, Arsenal were a point of head, uh, ahead of Leicester. After 11 games, you're six points ahead of us. And with 20 odd games left in the season, 25 games left, whatever it might be in the season, you know, there's still time to, uh, to turn that around. There's certainly enough points available uh, on the board, but you have to... You have to be able to, uh, as you say, control games and have to be able to play in a certain way. And I'm just curious as to, to how much of what's going on at Leicester now. I mean, clearly there's momentum and clearly the players are believing in what they're being asked to do. But is there sort of a clarity in terms of those instructions that makes it a little bit easier for them to carry them out on the pitch? Because from from an Arsenal perspective, we seem to go from one formation to the other. We're not quite sure who is supposed to do what. There's there's no cohesion, no fluency. Um, we don't create a great deal of chances. We allow too many chances. So f- from the Leicester point of view, it looks like it's easier to get performances out of the players when they understand what it is they're being told or asked to do. Yeah, I think there's, there's def- definitely a lot to be said for that. But I think it, it partly comes from uh, from your club as a whole, I think. Um, I think Rodgers has been definitely allowed to kind of have a, a good free reign with this team. Um, he, the, the difference between this season and, and last season is just the, the, the quality of control is just so much better. You know, having signing Yuri Tielemans was was 
a, a master stroke in the end because we actually got him for 32 million rather than 40 million which it just only makes him the more baffling that the other teams like Arsenal and Man mm. United didn't didn't do that uh, but what I also like about Rodgers is that while our, our team is, is pretty much nailed on 1-11 to 11 at the moment, he has shown some flexibility. So in our, in our worst performance of the season by a mile, which just happens to be at Old Trafford, we, we, he started with two defensive midfielders, basically, which was Ndidi and, and Hamza Chowdhury. Mm. And both good players in their own right, but um, not, not quite good enough together to control the game. And, and there was just too much space ahead of them and it didn't work out. So in the next game, which I think was was Tottenham at home. Um, he just played the one in, in Didi and, and added a bit more creativity in the middle. And, you know, the result was was a positive one. And he's, he carried that on ever since. So he, he's, he's not, it's not predictable as it was under Puel. Right. Where he would have a lot of side to side along the halfway line. <laughs> it would go out wide. Then you put in those low percentage crosses. Yeah. It's, it's just a bit more patient. It, the, the tempo's up, upped a little bit. And, you know, from, from my perspective, I'm hoping that will be um, a particularly good weapon against Arsenal, whose defenders look like they're struggling at every moment yes. in their lives. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I you know, for all the individual criticism they might get, I also feel desperately sorry for them because yeah. it is not an easy job, and this has not been this is not necessarily something that's that's um, just unique to Unai Emery. I can remember um, Sebastian Scalacci talking about life at Arsenal as a centre half, and it was almost like someone coming home from the war. Like the things I've seen, you wouldn't believe the things I've seen. Um, so, so it's definitely it's definitely an issue, and certainly when you've got somebody like Vardy, who is, uh, you know, for a central defender, I'd say one of the most annoying players uh, in the league to play against, and somebody who can run in behind, it, it's going to be a real job for them to to sort that out. I mean, um, I don't I don't know what the answer is for Arsenal, but. I, I do think that Emery will be gone either at the end of the season or before the end of the season. But I think the next manager, you know, there's potential there for, for something similar to Rodgers to happen to them because, you know, for all Emery's faults, and, and he has many, and, and I don't think he deserves to be there for much longer, you know, he, he, has, he has introduced a lot of young players to the team, which is always difficult. True, um, and true. maybe uh, a new manager can kind of hone their talents, um, introduce a little bit more structure. Yeah. Uh, and that, I guess that's the hope for everyone of an Arsenal connection. E- easier said than done, but yeah, I, who knows? Who knows? I mean, the thing about the young players is that they, they did take away some players that he would definitely have used a lot more than the young players. You know, in Iwobi and Mikatari and the club made a decision to move them on because they wanted the young players to get a chance. I'm not necessarily sure it was Emery saying, no, you can let them go because I want to let these kids run wild and free. And and maybe yeah. some of the management yeah. of those kids has been, you know, it's been good at times. You know, Saka has come through, but sort of hit a little bit of a wall. Willock started the season well, hit a little bit of a wall. Ainsley Maitland-Niles looks like he's kind of going backwards a bit he's lacking belief you know he can't even remember to take his his necklace off before he goes on the pitch now um gabriel martinelli a really exciting prospect um but you know i think that would be true regardless of of who was the manager i suppose another aspect of what's going on at leicester is a measure of defensive security so not only are you a team that that attacks well and creates chances, you you, you have got a good record defensively. Scored yeah. twenty seven goals this season and only conceded eight. When you put that in comparison with Arsenal, who've only scored sixteen but have conceded fifteen, you're really um, showing that uh, you know Rogers has made some improvement there as well. So people focus on him as a maybe a coach who focuses on the attack of uh, of his team, but defensively um, really good. And there's a, a young central defender there who Arsenal are very very strongly linked with, uh, who looks yeah. uh, looks a hell of a talent. He was, and frankly though, the reason I thought we'd finish seventh this season was because. I thought we would maybe a little bit short at centre back. So uh, seeing she was 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 hardly in the team last year, um, it, and for the games that he did play, I was I was always a bit worried whenever he was on the ball. Uh, you, you, the sort of play you're not sure, really sure what's going to happen next. Uh, but we didn't we didn't replace Harry Maguire. You know, selling him was the absolute right thing to do. Mm. Got great great money for him. It was a good move for all parties. Uh, but Rogers just didn't didn't replace him. He thought, well, I'm happy with what I've got, and let's let's go with this. And he's been absolutely right to be like that because soon she was arguably been our best player this season um, which is which is a lot to say really for for a team that's performed to a, a very high level all year all year he's just kind of got this this hilarious rambo streak in him where he'll just <laughs> you know i think the hair helps and the fact that he's just got this really square jaw 
but yeah. he's kind of like a another coming of Robert Hooth, really. But yeah, he's just he's just like got this all action style, which is just really entertaining to watch. Um, scary to watch. It has been in the past. He's a he's, he's got a little bit of a clumsy streak in him, but fundamentally he's been exceptional. And um, yeah, he's absolutely adored at the moment. Yeah, and and is that giving you the giving Leicester the platform to to play? the attacking football, the fact that there is some defensive security. Definitely, yeah. I mean, and also in, in Ndidi, you've you know arguably got the best ball-winning midfielder in the league. So, you know, he's for, for the last few seasons, he's been in the top two or three for interceptions and tackles with Adrissa Gay and, and, and Golo Conte. So he is essentially the best replacement we could have ever had for Conte, who was a virtually irreplaceable player at that time. Yeah. Um, he is, yeah, he's been a, a massive, massive player this year. And, he, and he's only 22, which is, which is amazing. Right. Well, yeah, we have our own issues with uh, defensive midfielders at Arsenal, obviously with yes, Granit Xhaka. It's, and... the, it's the screaming <laughs> question that, that, that just, I don't understand why no one's resolved it yet. Well, I mean, we did have, um, it looked like we'd found a guy in Lucas Torreira. Yeah. Um, and last season, his best performances came, you know, during the first part of the season when he was being played there and everyone went, this is the Again, guy. <laughs> against Leicester at the Emirates site. I was, I was at that game and yeah. he was absolutely incredible. And so was Mesut Ozil that day, actually. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a whole different story, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but look, Emery doesn't seem to want to play him as a defensive midfielder. Um, w- whether he might have to this weekend, um, I think he will, because I, I don't know if Xhaka can come back into the squad. Um, Ceballos is injured, which leaves him Genduzi, Torreira and Willock to choose from in central midfield. So we might see him there. But um, I don't want to ask you for a prediction because those are, you know, that's just gut feeling stuff. But are you are you confident based on what you've seen from your team this season and based on what you've seen from Arsenal this season that this is a game that Leicester can win? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to set set himself up for a fall. No, I, sure. There is no reason not to be confident at the moment, given the way you know we're, we're playing like a, a sustainable type style of football. And you know, while the the conversion stats probably aren't sustainable because they're so good, um, you know, it, it's well, fundamentally we're playing very well this year, and and Arsenal are not. So we're at home. Um, We've actually had a bit of success over Arsenal in, in recent years, which has yeah. been quite rare, given the historical woes that we've had against you. So, yeah, I am confident. Actually, I've got to say. Yeah, well, maybe we could go through this game without having a man sent off. It might do us um, <laughs> might do us would. a bit of good. It would help. <laughs> it would help. We need all the help we can get. Listen, we'll leave it there, Joe. Thanks very much. No problem. Joe is the deputy editor of 442 Magazine, and you can find him on Twitter at Joe Bruin FFT. That is at Joe Bruin FFT. He sounds a lot more confident about this weekend than we do. I guess we'll see what happens. Right now on the Arsecast, as you can tell from that little snippet of music, it is something Simpsons related. And if you're an Arsenal fan on Twitter and you're not already following Simpsons Arsenal, then what the hell is wrong with you? It is a fantastic account, Arsenalizing some of the great Simpsons moments. And I'm delighted to welcome to the Arsecast, Ben, who is the, what would you say, the curator of of Simpsons Arsenal? Yeah. Something like that. Hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, I know that this Simpsons um, in brackets something thing is is quite commonplace because I know there was like an, an Ireland yeah. Simpsons fans one that I, yeah. I used to see doing the rounds for ages. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess you were inspired by by one of those in particular or was it just the... the uh, I didn't actually know about them. Oh really? When I started. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've since found as that one. There was the there's like a Scottish football one, which right. looks pretty good, but the context I don't really understand understand a lot of it. <laughs> um, but when I I mean when I started it, it was it was in February, and we'd we just lost to Barte away, and um, that was when do you remember when Ozil posted the the Dennis Bergkamp quote? Oh yes. And, yeah, and it was just a mess, and everything was. Everyone hated everyone, and I was just posting a few Simpsons gifts on my normal account, and I quite enjoyed it. I had a look. I thought, is there a dedicated account that does this? And there was. There's an Arsenal Simpsons account. Right. But it had hadn't been active for years. I think 2017. So I thought, I'll give it a go myself. Pick up the and, baton. Um, 
Yeah, exactly. And it was pretty basic when I started. I was just getting gifts from Google. Um, and then I discovered Frinkiac.com, which allows you to make your own. And then that just opened up like a whole new level of creativity. Right. So this was like, you know, despite these things going on elsewhere, you were sort of, you were, you, you weren't necessarily influenced by them. No, um, that's, no, I mean, that's you, funny. you kind of, you know, you get, you kind of get into your own little bubble and mm. social media. Um, and that was it. I mean, I was, yeah. Um, I, there's now, I think there are now two Liverpool ones. Right. There's a Norwich one, a Newcastle one. <laughs> Norwich <Yeah>. Simpsons. <laughs> no, they're, honestly, honestly, no, I think it's like Norwich Simpsons memes. Right. Um, as a general English football one as well. So there's, there's quite a few popping up. Yeah, for sure. Right. Okay. So, you know, you start posting these things. I guess the question, the first question I have is that I'm always, you know, I, I'm a big fan of The Simpsons. Well, I was a big yeah. fan of The Simpsons for yeah, yeah, yeah. for maybe, what, the first eight, ten years. And then yeah, I, I haven't it. really, I haven't really been looking at it since. And I guess... No. You know, the golden years of The Simpsons is where is where all this stuff is coming from anyway. So you don't necessarily need to yeah. be you don't need to be up to date, I guess. But how do you look at what's going on and then think of a thing from The Simpsons that's relevant yeah. to it? Because when you put them out, I go, oh, my God, of course. Of course, like the one, yeah. the one about this week with the the Chinese man in the in the shop yeah, and the yeah, monkey's yeah. paw and it's like, oh, yeah, the cursed doll, and you're going, oh my god, that is so unbelievably perfect for this particular scenario. I'm curious as to like what comes first, like a, yeah. a Simpson scene that you put something to, or an idea that's in your head and you find a Simpson scene that fits it. Um, so when I started and I was just using Google, it was what's going on, Google, you know, the Simpsons, whatever, and see what comes up. Um, once I was able to be a bit more creative with it, it's, it has become the other way. So the notes section on my phone is just filled <laughs> with like, you know, classic scenes and quotes. And then if something's happening, I'll have a quick look at that, see what kind of makes sense. And then if I can if I can get it to match up. I mean, there's some scenes that in theory should do, and then I kind of make it and it just doesn't work. So I just, I just binned it off. Right. There have been quite, quite, quite a few like that. But the one on, on Sunday, the, uh, the Chinese man one, I actually made that once I woke up on Sunday morning and it was in like 10 minutes and it was just done. And it was, yeah, it was, it's nuts. Sometimes it just, sometimes I get the idea when I'm not doing anything or doing something really mundane, like, yeah, washing dishes or that is that know, is the brushing teeth yeah yeah yeah. are you in like uh, you know i don't want to pry too heavily into your life but uh, you know on a day-to-day -day basis are you involved in in creative things or is it no nope. no so nope. no, no, no. so i think what you're what no. you're getting at there is actually something that that um is quite common w with um people within creative industries that all, all of a sudden you're doing something and then you get an idea or, yeah. you know, it, it's happened to me even in terms of um, the blog. You know, you wake up and you've got the first line of the blog or the theme of the blog yeah. or something like that, that it's, it's just sort of in your head. Um, that must have been tough after the Europa League game. Um, you know, the weird thing is, and I think you're probably seeing this a bit yourself um, at the moment, because when, you, when, when, things, are, when things are good... And yeah. let me be clear, I would prefer things to be better than they are right now <laughs> yeah. uh, on the pitch and off the pitch and everything else. I would much prefer if it was all a bit more mundane and Arsenal were, you know, more successful and winning games and being more competitive. Yeah. Um, there isn't quite the depth of stuff to talk about or discuss or debate or, in your case, to make Simpsons-related jokes about. You know, if we were winning 3-0 yeah. every week... I think your account would be a little bit less busy because it's difficult yeah, to say. Probably. Well, that was good. Yep. Yep, it was good. Uh, <laughs> now what? <laughs> I can't. I can't imagine a Man City Simpsons account like, oh, we won again. Great. Yeah. Well, they're probably just complaining about how everyone hates them in some way. So that would probably. probably be it. This is it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is true that when it's the international break and nothing's going on, mm. um, you you can't really react. To anything because yeah. nothing's going on yeah. but it does um allow you to do things a bit more creatively and a bit more i guess i don't know abstract <laughs> yeah or, or odd 
Yeah. Um, so I, I, I try and keep it going at least one a day. Um, I mean, that will probably peter out at some point. Yeah, yeah Hopefully, yeah. when we start winning. <laughs> but we, we will see. We'll it doesn't see. look like it's happening anytime soon, so no, I think exactly. you're safe. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think you're I'm safe good for, for a, good, a good, few, good few years yet. Yeah, and I think what, what um, is worth stressing as well is that even if, you know, you're dealing with subject matter that is... Uh, I'm not going to say contentious, but which certainly gets um, people talking, which exercises yeah. people's opinions about the football club and about the manager and all, all that kind of stuff, is that, you know, you're doing this in, in good spirit. It's just kind yeah. of, look, while times are bad, let's see if we can have a laugh because um, otherwise yeah. you go a bit crazy. So it is it is um, meant in a in a good spirit, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, Twitter can be such a toxic place. Mm. Um so having a bit of light relief, I think, has been quite welcomed. Mm. Um, I mean, some of the comments I get are just so lovely and you know, just genuinely nice bunch of people following my account. It's really nice. Um, I mean, I think someone said today, like, this is where we come to laugh instead of cry. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that that's pretty much it. And it's changed my own perception a bit because, I mean, we take it so seriously. And then... And, running the account just makes me see the funny side of things or at least try and look for humor in some, you know, pretty crap situations. Yes. Yes. Like I said, they keep giving you this, they're feeding you, they're force feeding you content. You're like, um, what's, what do they call it when they put the, uh, you know, when they force feed a goose to make uh, foie gras. Yeah. Uh, what's yeah. it called? Gavage. Like, That's what that uh, is. I'm like that scene when Homer's eating all of those donuts <laughs> And he's just lapping them up. He just keeps having more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's, that's pretty much what it is. At some point, you'll get to to the scene where, you know, where Homer tries to, uh, he has a steak eating competition with some trucker. And he just can't, oh, yeah. He's like he's eating so much and he keeps putting a piece of meat in his mouth. It keeps, going, <laughs> keeps plopping back yeah. out because he's just so full. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what, what have been but, some of your favorites? And some of my favorite posts that I've done? Yeah. Um. God, I like the, the kind of the really just odd ones. Like there's a one I did about Kieran Tierney, um, how he was teasing us with good performance in the cups. And it's, you know, when groundskeeper Willie is doing the, the basic instinct thing and he's <laughs> uncrossing his legs. And then just at his crotch, I put better than Roberto Carlos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that, I mean, that, that took a while. I and mean, I had, groundskeeper willie's open crotch on my screen for a long time to get that right and it's just but it came it came together nice nicely and kirantini actually likes it himself oh that's cool that's cool there's um there's a, a validation for your work um when kirantini yeah. likes it um in, in terms of the simpsons themselves uh how big a fan are you, I mean, were you sort of, I guess, of an era where you just grew up with it? It was on all yeah. the time. And every time you turned the TV on, there was always Simpsons. I mean, we had it here. You know, we had it on Sky every evening. We yeah. had it on RTE every evening. So you could just watch Simpsons for like a couple of hours every evening if you wanted to. Yeah, no, exactly that. I mean, I'm 31 now. So I basically grew up with peak Simpsons and mm. peak Arsenal as well. Um, so <laughs> Exactly that. It was just on all the time. So yeah. I've grown up with it and it's just in my brain. Like, I, especially now doing the account, I'll, I'll look at something that's happening on the street and I thought, oh, I could do a gif about that. But I'm like, <laughs> no one would understand what it's about. So yeah. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it was, it's just, and now it's on Channel 4. And yeah, but as you say, Sky in the 90s had it. It was Sky 2. It was on Sky 2 as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it just it, it would be on at 5 in the afternoon, 6 in the yeah. afternoon, 7. Seven. Um, yeah. You could just sort of pick out on Simpsons. So, I mean, uh, if you had to pick a couple of Simpsons episodes that are your absolute favorite, what would they be? Oh, I think I really like the one with when they move home and Hank Sc Scorpio is there yes. as, his, as his boss. Yeah, that one's great. I think he's probably the best single episode character that they've had 
Yeah. Um, so that one, and then I'd who, say... Who the, was the voice of uh, Hank Scorey? It was Albert Brooks, wasn't it, I think? Oh, was it? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Yeah, Albert Brooks was, was Hank Scorpio. And of course, we have Hank Scorpio in the squad as well. We do. In the shape we of Shkodran Mustafi. He is a little less flamethrowery than the real <laughs> Hank Scorpio, but there are times where I think maybe maybe he could he do be. with a, a bit more flamethrowers. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Um, yeah, that one and the the monorail one. Um, yeah. I, th- I think that Leonard Nimoy... It's probably just the best guest appearance that they've had. Yeah, he's so good, so great. I do love the monorail ones, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the the songs that the Simpsons have put out yeah. have been have been really amazing. And and there's just so much that's in our lexicon every day that we yeah. we say that's just come from the Simpsons, and nobody thinks about it one way or the other. Um, they they've truly embiggened our vocabularies. <laughs> They have exactly. Mm. We need some kind of re big re big you later <laughs> to get back to it. Yeah, um, I have to say another one of my favorites is the. Um, I know it's a, a classic, and maybe people will roll their eyes, but I think the the Cape Fear episode with yeah, with yeah, Sideshow Bob, and again, there's more the singing rakes. in there. Yeah, well, the rakes is just. I mean, I can't explain how much I laughed the first time I ever saw that rake yeah. scene. You know, it could have gone on for another two minutes. And I wouldn't have stopped laughing. It was just yeah. that good. Um, I love that. And I love, uh, you know, Kelsey Grammer is fantastic as the voice of Sideshow Bob as well. Um, right. Final question for you. Mm. If you right now were put in charge of Arsenal, who have just told okay. Unai Emery that it's over, it's time to yeah. go back to Spain or find a new job somewhere else, Unai. But you have to appoint a Simpsons character as yeah. the new Arsenal manager. Who are you going to appoint? I think at this stage, I take the inanimate carbon rod. Um, <laughs> he has no, to get a no. mention. He has to get I think, a mention. I think, I think Hank, Hank Scorpio would probably be amazing. He's such a likable guy. I think we'd really connect with him. Um, and he'd also give us a real edge. I mean, can you imagine mm. J- Jamie Vardy breaking away from our defence and him just shouting, stop him, he's supposed to die. <laughs> and that would be amazing. <laughs> it would be good. He could just blow up Leicester as well. If we if they this beat us, it. he could just blow up Leicester. This uh, is it. What, what about you? Who, who do you have? I, I was sort of thinking first of like the managerial dream team, which I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody else is thinking of, which is uh, Lenny and Carl. Um, oh, yeah. Sort of like the Brian Brian Clough and Peter Taylor of 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 the Simpsons. In the end, though, I decided I would go for astronaut Barney Gumble. Oh yeah. So when Barney when gets, he was all clean, yeah, he was all clean and sober, and he was able to do like backflips and all that kind of stuff. I feel like we need that that young, vibrant. Uh, energy that that sober Barney Gumble would bring. Eventually, he would lapse back into his hopeless alcoholism, um, uh, and it would That's all go fine. horribly wrong. But for a while, I think he would invigorate the team. So, uh, astronaut Barney Gumble for me, I reckon. Good. I think Nelson could probably do a job as well. <laughs> <laughs> or haha, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Ben, uh, congrats on the account. It really is very, Thank very you. funny. If you're not following it already, it is at Simpsons Arsenal. Um, and I look forward to uh, what this weekend brings us. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Can't beat a good bit of Simpsons. Thank you to Ben and to at Simpsons Arsenal. Can you imagine the scene this weekend if Arsenal don't get the right result? Unai Emery makes his way out of the dressing room. Approaches the away fans, stands there with his, with his arms out. I bring you love. It's bringing love. Don't let it get away. Break its legs. Kill it. Kill it. And when we talk about um, the Simpsons having an impact on modern life and culture, every time I hear that song Downtown by Petula Clark, I sing it in, in Groundskeeper Willie's voice. I'm pretty certain that I am not alone there. Anyway, it's all very entertaining. Let's hope Arsenal can provide some entertainment this weekend. It is a big game. It's a big game. Whatever you think about the manager and what impact a bad result might have on him, a bad result will also have a big impact on Arsenal as well. Um, It is possible to, uh, to not lose and still 
make the kind of change that I think we need to make. So let's hope we can do that. Let's hope that the powers that be have got their heads together. Let's hope that we don't fall further behind in the race for the top four because it's going to be more and more difficult if we do. So, look, your guess is as good as mine about, you know, how we're going to play, what formation we're going to use, what team selection we're going to have. Um, no doubt we'll be scratching our heads beforehand and probably during, and I don't know what we're going to be thinking afterwards. I just don't know. It's impossible to predict anything with this Arsenal side at this moment in time. Um, our inferiority complex when we face smaller opposition is is manifestly obvious. I just wonder if, given that we're we're perceived as kind of underdogs going into this one, it might provoke a kind of response or, or a performance, the likes of which we've seen from Unai Emery's teams when we play a North London derby or when we play one of the other big teams uh, in the Premier League. Let's see what happens. I can't say I'm that confident, um, but it will give us plenty to discuss on the blog over the weekend and, of course, on the Arscast Extra on Monday with James. So join us for that. Please share the podcast with your Arsenal-supporting friends who might not be listening yet, who haven't got into the joy of podcasts. There are still lots of them out there. Give us a recommendation. Give us a share. Uh, say something nice on iTunes and give us a review. Whatever it might be, we'd appreciate it. If you don't want it, that's fine. Also, have yourselves a fantastic weekend. Football um, will have a big part in that, of course, as well. But Aside from that, have a great weekend and I will catch you on the next show with James on Monday. Until then, take it easy. Cheers. Bye-bye. Welcome back to Sky Sports News and the latest update is that Tottenham forward Son Young-Min has had his three-game ban overturned having been sent off against Everton during which Andre Gomez suffered a horrific ankle injury and will miss the rest of the season. Tottenham made an appeal to the FA. Maurizio Pochettino wrote a letter which we have here in front of you. It says, Dear FA, cheers, son's crying. That appears to have been enough for them to withdraw the red card issued by Martin Atkinson and instead issue it to Gomez, who will be banned for three games as soon as he's fit again. Meanwhile, Jose Mourinho says he would be interested in the role of Queen of England. Speaking earlier today, Jose said, He's 93. She don't last forever. Coming up next on Sky Sports News, Jamie Vardy tells us how he can open tins with his beak right after the break.